I cannot go live. Can you go live? We're, it says we're live now and recording. Uh, to me, it says that it ends all the time. Uh, it says we're live for me as well, if that's any. Yeah, help. now it's uh, now I'm in. Yeah. All right. Um, do we see the other participants? Not yet, I think. So it's best perhaps to wait because otherwise it's um, the three of us talking to each other. So um, I guess we wait till other participants come in. Maybe just wait a minute or two um, yeah. because the, the session's recorded. People can come and view it later uh, if, if they can't make it now. Yeah. So we wait, uh, we wait, uh, shall we say we wait for uh, three minutes till um, 419 and then start? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, on the topic, I'll just share something I, I got from uh, one of the Ukrainians that works for me. Um, mm -hmm. It's from our customers. So he had a customer call uh, today, and this is what they did on the call. It's very beautiful. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, that is, oh, that is so, that's. That's a real um, something, uh, you know, that uh, supportive. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, Tim is joining us. Tim Nicole, welcome. Yeah. Active in the room. So, Tim, we think about uh, waiting for two more minutes so uh, to have people. Um, um join us and then we will uh, we will start ah there we have <laughs> we went through that sand and it works <laughs> So we start in about uh, one minute with uh, the session. Welcome to those of you who have uh, joined us at the moment and uh, we will start. Well, let's just get started now. So uh, welcome to you all um, in this uh, session about the CEO's role in scaling their firm's application of artif artificial intelligence and although modern CEOs today recognize the need of doing so and to scale technology across uh, business, their business um, for AI applications that seems to be uh, still not the case as it, um, as it could be and should be. Now, before we start this session, I think um, we had a brief uh, discussion before about the situation in the world and our, our hearts go out to the people of the Ukraine and those involved uh, in um, in the situation uh, um, in, in Europe, something which we probably wouldn't have expected when we would have had this, uh, uh, say, last month. And today we know we are in a completely different situation. So it's something that's uh, dear to our heart. Uh, many of, um, uh, let's say, also the two uh, panelists uh, here present uh, are also um, um, feeling that impact with people they work with. So it's something um, 
I have it myself with the students uh, that uh, come from the Ukraine uh, and France. So I think it's all something that, uh, yeah, that uh, impacts all of us. Now, um, if we uh, look at uh, today's uh, panelists, um, uh, we have uh, Rob Lesley. He is um, a serial entrepreneur and created a number of successful companies throughout uh, his career, um, being Million, Siddiqui, Kicker, which is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, and he has developed patented privacy enhancing technologies to help people and business build secure data collaborations without uh, compromising on the confidentiality of privacy that um, that employers uh, are embedded AI elements of the platform. We also have Sedarius uh, Perotta is a Georgetown University alum, a Peace Corp volunteer, three times tech founder and CEO of AI startup Shelf. Um, I, IO. And um, basically, I would like to give the floor to uh, Rob to uh, to kick off this session. Great. Um, thank you, Desiree. Um, great to, to be here. Um, just as you were introducing uh, the topic, you know, I'd just like to make a very small comment about what's happening in Ukraine. Um, we have, we're a small company. We have uh, two people who we work with on a daily basis. Um, and uh, we spoke to them before uh, the war started. Uh, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to contact them um, since uh, since the war uh, began. Um, I hope they're they're safe. Um, but at this point, we haven't been able to to reach them. Um, I just hope uh, we, we get to the point where we're, we're able to figure this out as a as a world fairly quickly. Um, and try and maybe uh, sit down and talk because at the end of the day, uh, it will only be resolved through discussion and dialogue. Um, my my interest here today, uh, I, I have spent a number of years working in cybersecurity. Um, we've uh, been looking at um, the use of artificial intelligence, particularly around biometric systems um, where uh, we use uh, artificial intelligence to um, measure uh, people's faces, people's fingerprints um, uh, in the context of identifying them when they cross borders, uh, when they access services, um, when they you know, go through some kind of remote uh, authentication service. Um, one of the things that I'm very conscious of is the sensitivity of the information that we process in many cases um, and how we use that information and sometimes use it in, in a context where the whose information it is actually doesn't understand in depth what we're using the information for. So that the ethics of, of how we use information, the choices we make in um, the systems we create uh, are something, are things that are very close to my heart. Um, I, I, through my work with the World Economic Forum, I've participated in a number of um, panel sessions, uh, particularly around the use of AI in, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, autonomous weapons, um, you know, and, you know, it's very topical right now, uh, um, you know, with, with the war happening um, and the fact that, you know, drones uh, are going to start taking um, a much more active role in, in, um, in, in warfare as we know it. Um, some of the systems that we would develop uh, around the use of biometrics, for example, um, can be deployed in these systems. Um, yet we, as a company, have never really thought about um, how the technology could be used in a negative context. We always think about it in a positive context, in a, in a life-affirming situation where we're actually improving you know, people's daily lives by making things more convenient, more easy to use, um all, all of those different things and i think you know um as a society generally we need to think about technology in a much more holistic sense um both in the terms of uses of it for good but also the uses of it for bad um and what happens when things go wrong um do we need regulation uh to to put controls and gates and and fences around um what is acceptable what is unacceptable 
um, when when we start to think about these things. So this is a very broad area, um, you know, and, and it ultimately comes down to choices, uh, choices that we make as a society, choices that we make as as individuals, um, the values that we bring to the to the conversation, both on a personal level uh, and at a societal level, and what we deem acceptable. Um, is, is this uh, acceptable? Um, for the society that, that we want to live in both now and in the future. So I'm looking forward yeah, to the conversation. And Rob, so Rob, yeah. so you also help companies uh, to build a digital identity huh? uh, to better uh, our, um, AI with less human input. Uh, so what is your advice to CEOs who want to make, let's say, um, use AI for the better? So I think uh, you, you, yeah, you, so, you can so, use so. it for the better and for or for, for, for bad, for good or for bad. So if, if they want to use that, what would be your, what are your sort of three top advices uh, regarding that? To really understand what the impact of, of artificial intelligence um, will, will do. Um, understanding that AI is basically... Uh, a, a, an algorithm or a set of algorithms that run on, runs on top of data. So the data that you feed the algorithm ultimately will have a major impact on, on what comes out of that algorithm. So having, um, having data that uh, is um, consistent, it's clean, um, it doesn't have inherent biases, for example, um, all of these things are going to be really, really, impo really, really important. So, um, it needs a lot of thought. Uh, it's not a case of, oh, I'm going to have an AI that's going to do this. Um, it, it really needs structured, um, properly sequenced thought um, in advance of, in, of implementing anything. And then after thought comes action. So what would be the action that uh, uh, CEOs need to take after they have had the, the careful thoughts? So, so for me, a key thing is measurement. You've got to be able to measure the outcome against what was expected. Um, and everything needs to be explainable. Um, if you end up with an outcome that wasn't uh, easily explained um, or you ended up in a place that was unimagined at the beginning, you probably need to stop um, and reassess because you very easily could end up going down a path that... Um, the machine will start to recommend things to you that were unintended. Uh, and then the law of unintended consequences starts to, to come into play, which very quickly can get out of control if, if you haven't got um, automated breakpoints or, or the off switch uh, that, that you can play when you need to. So what, how do you build in uh, breakpoints? Well, this comes in into the design process. Um, so when you're... When you're designing things along the way, it, it is possible to build in those steps to say, we're going to stop at this point and assess. Um, you, you don't need to uh, turn it on and just let it run wild um, in a completely uncontrolled fashion. You can have um, fa a phased approach to something where you're able to run something for a period of time, allow it to learn, allow it to you know, do what it's meant to do, um, and then it can stop. Or you just say for a period of time, we're going to assess um, the results that have been delivered um, and then adjust. And being able to adjust um, as you go is, is really important because uh, it allows you to fix you know, errors that, that may have arisen for biases that may have occurred in, in our world. Um, you know, um, many of the biometric algorithms that are used um, have difficulty uh, recognizing black people, for example. Um, they have uh, identified that these biases exist. They're generally unintended. Um, you know, they weren't programmed there to begin with, but it comes from a mix of technology uh, limitations, uh, you know, uh, biases of, of the developers who may have been completely uh, unintended, um, but been working on a data set, for example, that was limited. Um, so it, it allows you to address these things. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before we continue, let me um, ask uh, Sadarius um, to um, to um, comment and also to um, to to make his introduction 
on and his perspective on uh, using artificial intelligence in a um, uh, let's say in a positive uh, in a positive way and that um, and and give some advice to CEOs how to do that absolutely thanks uh, first I'll just do it uh, make a shout out to uh, our people in Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, Slava Ukraina Slava Ukraina Slava Ukraina so um, heavy topic it's always hard to switch um, but uh, I been in AI for over a decade. I've made many, many mistakes um, trying to go too big, too fast, too, too large a vision. Uh, I think I've come away with some, a very practical view for CEOs of AI. Uh, the current company I'm with, Shelf, we use data from customer calls and emails and messages. And we take all that data, all that information, and we use it to automate answers to questions that are embedded in those interactions. So we have an automated answer platform. And uh, getting to that point was, it was a journey. Uh, so I think that's one of the things I'd like to make the main point of anything that I'm going to say today is AI is a journey. Um, it's not a destination and it won't end as long as uh, the business world that I know of it, it still exists. So I think there's a really interesting um, quote, uh, I guess, saying from sailors uh, when they got lost at sea. And it was that there's water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And it's a pretty profound statement if you think about it. And I thought about it and I said, this is very similar to AI. Uh, because one, only 1% 1 of the average organization's data is being used for anything, not AI, being used for anything at all. So the vast majority of data is just junk and it's just being thrown away. And is that the research that's done? Uh, where, where does that, yeah? Yeah, that, that was a statistic I found uh, from, uh, I, I, I can get you the source, but yes, it's a statistic. I can, I can source it for you. Uh, so no problem there. I could send an email and post it. So, so yeah, it, the vast majority of data. And then, and then you start asking yourself, well, well, what is it? What is data? What is the value? What are we driving to? And then ultimately, what is AI? It took me a while to figure this out, uh, for myself at least. And it's just patterns. The, the, the computing power of the machine is infinitely greater than our brains. So all that means is that there's all this information and that a computer has the ability to see connections between all this information that a, a human brain couldn't, thousand brains couldn't. And it's, it's in real time and it's immediate and it's very powerful. And what that means is that a human brain can get a new insight. They can see something they never saw before. And with that insight, it changes your decision-making process. You have new information. It's valuable information. Now you decide differently. And ultimately that leads to a different strategy, which is why I, I think it's not a competitive advantage for organizations to adopt AI as a strategy. I think it is, uh, it is survival. Um, the good news is I think we have a lot of time, uh, but those who do it earlier are gonna be able to have more insight, going to have more better decision making thus they're going to be more competitive they're going to be able to outmaneuver so so then the question is where is it practical to apply ai and then how uh, addressing some of your questions so there's three areas that i see uh you could bring ai uh, all the patterns and, and the decision making you could bring it into a product that could be any product that can be a chair uh it can be a hat, uh, it could be a shoe, because you just have data, you have sensors, you have people impressing on it, and hey, are you walking right? Is your back straight? Is this, uh, is this gonna lead to problems in the future? It connects to your medical records. You know the way that you're walking is causing this particular illness or there's a high probability that it is or a correlation, that type of stuff. So there's a product side of it, there's a service side of it. Any service can benefit from also embedding AI in it. And then the third thing I see is a business process application. So you have a business process, 
I heard uh, there was a, an article in the Financial Times about someone, I don't know if it was Goldman Sachs or, or someone applying AI to a 146 step process of going uh, IPO. And you can't use AI for all 146 steps, but maybe three steps you can automate because you, the patterns create a, a, an insight with a high enough threshold of certainty where you're like, oh yeah, just make the decision. I feel comfortable with it. So those are kind of the, the areas that I see that can be impacted. And then from my perspective, like how do you implement AI in your organization? Because you have to, whether you're a government, whether you're an NGO, especially NGOs, uh, in my opinion, um, and, and our company is going to uh, be donating uh, to this cause of, of enabling uh, NGOs to, to more effectively use AI. Um, and, then, and then companies, of course. And from my perspective, having failed so many times, like I am a, I am a case study in failure in applying AI. I think that the best thing to do is you have to look at it as a long-term strategy and a core competency and one that you're not going to get overnight. And you brainstorm a bunch of ideas, the organization does, and then, or the leadership does, and then you pick the, the, the easiest, smallest uh, possible projects that you have on that list that have some measurable outcome. So you have this huge list and some things are really big and crazy and visionary. And then there's these small things that are just, like, oh, yeah, if we did that, that would help us a tiny bit. And I think those are the ones that you start with. Uh, I think that uh, you try to do a project that's less than three months. You don't necessarily want to outsource it if you're looking at it strategically because you want to do it. You want to bring that expertise in house. So you want to hire people and then you want to bring people that are already part of your organization uh, to work on a project to implement this tiny little AI thing. And then through that, you're, you're, you're flexing a muscle. It's just like going to the gym. You're just, you're, you're, you're working out. It's your first time in the gym and you're working out your capacity to do AI. And then you do another project and then you do another project and you do another project and then you hire some more people. And over time, uh, and this is actually what Google did, uh, over time you build, um, it becomes a core competency of the business and becomes integrated in everything you do, but it starts very small, as small as possible. And that, that, that's kind of my perspective, at least from a 20,000 foot view. Yeah. Well, I think it's a very useful uh, perspective. Is that something that you recognize Rob that starting really small? I really like that, that sort of um, the list with all the projects and you start the tiniest, the smallest, but with measurable results, you also measure, you also mentioned being measurable is very important and that's the one you pick. Yeah, absolutely. And just going back to what Sidaria said uh, about the 1%, it, it might've been a report that uh, McKinsey produced. I'm not sure. I, I saw something similar where they said today a uh, about 1% of all the world's data is being analyzed. The, the digital economy is worth something like $11.5 trillion. Um, and at least 10% of that, $11.5 trillion, is uh, derived from analysis of that 1% of, of, of data. So what they were basically saying was that if you could analyze another 1% of the data, you might be able to generate another $1 to $2 trillion of value um, simply by just tapping into that data. So one of the other things that, that we do is um, we look at um, discrete data sets that um, hold value in and of themselves, but when you put them together, um, you may be able to extract more value um, simply because you've now got a bigger pool of information that you can run your algorithms on top of. Um, we have a specific use case uh, where we work with financial institutions to try and identify fraud, for example, uh, money laundering and other kinds of, you know, financial crime. Um, you know, and as we know, financial services is pre not predominantly about the movement of a transaction. So money moves from one party to another. So there are two sides, at least in, 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 this, in this process. And when you're able to look at both sides at the same time, you're able to figure out a lot more than when you look at them separately. It's like looking at a, you know two sides of a coin at the same time. Um, 
rather than looking at the front one time and then looking at the back a different time because you're, you're going to learn different things. And one of the things that we have struggled, you know, with a lot of the institutions we work with is to try and convince them that um, collaboration where you work together um, can actually yield really valuable insights. And, you know, the algorithms that we run are predominantly neural networks where we're trying to identify patterns. Um, those patterns, you know, will identify illicit activity of some kind. Um, and even though we were able to explain this, CEOs really struggle with the idea of, of collaboration. And the way we've uh, managed to um, position things is exactly what Sedarius was saying. Frame something that is really simple in a very constrained, contained time frame, and make it successful um, so that you actually de-risked it massively um, by choosing the parameters around the project that almost guarantee it's going to be successful. And the one thing no, that but we... you also you also see that that some organizations don't have the data architecture in place to actually um, be able to um, to profit from any uh, AI uh, and 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 I think the and and some organizations think they are more mature than they actually are. Um, totally. So totally. so if you look at these two elements. Um, how do you deal with that? Because I think that is happening in a lot of organizations. A lot of people talk about big data, AI, but if you look at their data architecture and, 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 and how the data is organized in, the, in their organization, it's nowhere close to being able to do anything with AI. So how do you sort of tackle that? So, so again, as part of the project, just let me, I, I was going to say something. When, when you have a project that delivers a success, it automatically attracts others to it because they want to be connected to success. Mm -hmm. uh, you've de-risked it for the people that come afterwards and sure. it's much easier for them to engage. Now, coming back to your question, as part of the, the exercise that we go through, again, we don't try and boil the ocean here. We, we select a data set that is probably a very small subset of the whole. Um, and there's a little bit of probably maybe cheating going on in that we know the quality of this data set um, is pretty good um, in that it's complete, um, it's clean, it's been f f refreshed. Um, you know, so all of those parameters that we, we need to know um, are you know, pretty good uh, in order to help make us succeed um, are there. The, the, the one thing that we've, we've noticed is with all of these projects, there has to be a governance framework, the rules of the game. Um, and actually people spend an awful lot of time arguing about the rules, um, what data you can use, what you can't use, when it's appropriate, when it's inappropriate, um, what happens when it goes wrong, who's accountable, you know, all of these things actually consume way more time than the technical elements, which usually can get done pretty quickly um, because you know, the technologists know how to build algorithms, they know how to run them. You just run them against the data and you get a result. Um, but it's all of those soft things that you have to have around the periphery in order to make sure that your governance framework and your policy um, is clear and that you've got um, compliance with law. Um, you know, Again, the European Union in particular would have within GDPR, a lot of rules around automated processing. Um, you've got to make sure that you, you, you comply with all of those things. So understanding what your obligations are is critically important as well. So Darius yeah. had his hand up there. So let him... Yeah, no, no. I, um, I, I think that uh, that is very um, <laughs> clear and helpful. As said, um, is that also the, something that uh, you, um, you recommend that you look at... Um, is that what you meant with looking at the tiny, smallest project that you also look at the data set that you select a data set that is really um, suitable to do such a project? Uh, is, is that something that you um, that you recommend? And, and also then uh, importantly, look at the governance framework. Uh, what is your um, take on that? 
Yeah, I would just, uh, I'd like to just provide an additional context. I think it's going to be very rare for a business nowadays not to have the data. Like, I, I, I would challenge that, like, maybe like a, a dry cleaner or a uh, hairdresser or some small. No, small it's not that they don't have the data. It's the way the data is organized, the, the data architecture. And I think a lot of organizations will have the data. But is it organized in such a way that you can actually use it uh, to the benefit? Yeah, that's that's what I was saying. There's always somewhere <laughs> that you can use the data. Like, there's always somewhere. Like, do you have a customer service department? Yes. Well, then there's going to be data there that you could definitely use. Do you use Slack? Maybe. If you do, then there's or Microsoft Teams. There's there's plenty of places. Again, going for the lowest hanging fruit and just trying to get a foothold into the strategy because <laughs> what's going to happen is you're going to learn as you go. And from, from my experience, and, and let me just give you the context. I, uh, I got into this field uh, like 2009 with like big ideas and I got funding for big ideas and I tried to implement them and used ML and NLP and all sorts of semantic web and knowledge graphs before they were a thing and tried to boil the ocean going back to my analogy and like, I think that's a recipe for failure, um, but there's a lot to extract from that recipe. And that is like thinking about too many things all at the same time. And, and, and going back to just the simple little steps of like a baby chick, and just little steps, it's like, just find a place that you, every work has, the de- has data. So just find a place where you have something to work with and do a brainstorm and create a whole a big list and then just define a project that will add value without some huge expectation, something small, something contained. And then as you go through it, you're going to start, you're going to, I mean, you're going to obviously use a, um, an agile process in doing it. And as you go through that agile process, you're going to learn gaps. You're going to learn things that you need to do. You're going to learn things that you need to be thinking about for the next project because you're going to be so focused on uh, making this one project successful or whoever's the the, P, the project lead of it uh, is going to be so focused on making it successful that they're going to already be thinking about what needs to be in place. And that would be my perspective on this. My humble perspective is to not try to think about too much because everything Rob's saying is absolutely true. I, I can't disagree with any of it. It's all true. Um, the only context I would, I would add to it is, is, Think about that in steps and stages and not all at once because you're going to get overwhelmed and uh, it's very, it, it is very overwhelming. And, and actually, again, having, having a little bit of uh, pattern recognition myself and success and failure in this, it's where I see AI projects fail and where I've seen um, the organization say, oh, AI is overhyped. It's not overhyped at all. It's how you're executing on it. it you, you, you executed on it poorly. You ran a bad project. It's not AI. AI, AI is not, it is what it is. It's pattern recognition and using that to create insights and using the insights to create better decisions. There's no doubt. There's no question that that will change every single industry, every single product, every single service in the world uh, over the next 20 years. So it's not that it's overhyped. It's that people try to do too much or they they try to bite off more than they can chew and they fail at it and then the whole organization has this adverse reaction and and turtles up they just up oh, doesn't work and then they lose their competitive advantage and that's like that's the danger for CEOs is to see a failure as correlating it with AI no your failure is your strategy in implementing it not the AI the AI the AI is AI it's like electricity. It just is what it is. It has power. Yeah. Whether you harness it or not is is up to you. <laughs> I, I completely agree with that, and I can relate to it because, you know, that there's there's almost um, a belief that AI is all, is almost like a truth machine. It, it, it's going to fix all your problems, and it's going to deliver this wonderful result that's suddenly going to turn you know a, a rubbish business into a really wonderful one. That's not going to happen. It, you know, an AI is not going to do that. 
you know, as, as Seth says, you know, it, it's about identifying patterns and helping you figure out what those patterns are so that you can make decisions. Um, and I, I think, you know, some of it comes from misplaced expectation that, you know, it's going to do way more than it actually is intended to do. So understanding what, you know, wh what it really can do well and what it's not going to do well um, would be a really good place to start for most CEOs. And um, if you say making it measurable, how can you make, can you give some advice on how you can make it measurable? Because I think that's an important one to make it measurable, how you can do that. <clears throat> Well, t let me give you an example. Today, um, most banks know uh, how much money they lose to fraud, right? So, you know, it, it might be 1%, 2%, 3% of, of, of their earnings, just for argument's sake. Um, and they could say, right, we're going to, we're going to deploy AI and um, the goal we set ourselves is we want to see, you know, a 30% improvement in our fraud number. Um, where we, we try and move it from, just for argument's sake, from 2% down to you know, 1.5% or, or something less than that. Um, all of those things can be measured. Um, and it will tell you whether uh, the actions you've taken are actually delivering the right results. Now, if you've deployed an AI, um, some algorithm that is helping you to do that, and you find that the number is going in the right direction, then um, you know that it's working. But equally, if it's not going in the right direction, you may need to tweak something. Uh, the algorithm may have a parameter that's wrong. You're looking at uh, a, a wrong uh, field, maybe. Uh, the timeliness of the data when it's being ingested may, may be wrong. But there's a whole variety of things that, that could be wrong. But if you're not measuring it, uh, you will never know. Uh, yeah. So you, you've got to measure um, and you've understand what good looks like. Yeah. Seb, do you have any um, uh, tips on the how to make it measurable? Yeah, sure. Again, I, I think, uh, like Rob, I'll, I'll rely on my my industry because uh, it's it's just very very clear to me uh, for, from from my little tiny perspective. But uh, somewhere you already have metrics, so you don't want to go create new metrics for AI. Like, what's something you're already measuring? So like, for example, if it's a customer service department, maybe you're measuring your average handle time or your first contact resolution or your CSAT or something. You're met, you, you have metrics, you're looking, there's plenty of analytical dashboards and you start with somewhere that you already have a metric and then you implement something that you're trying to make the tiniest impact on that. You're not saying, okay, I'm going to improve our, our average, the average time I'm on a call with a customer is six minutes. You're not trying to say, oh, we're going to bring it down to four. <laughs> we're going to try over, we're going to implement this. We're going to monitor it. We're going to adjust it over three months. And we're going to try to bring it down to uh, five minutes and 45 seconds. Something very achievable. Something that you can actually do. And then... Then you build off of that. So you, 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 you start with somewhere where you already are measuring. You create a, a, a small iteration and improvement that is that everyone in the organization can say, yeah, that's positive. That's good. And then and then you build on that. And you, you contain the project in such a way where you can execute on it realistically, conservatively, I would say. Do something mm -hmm. conservative. But you still get organizational and stakeholder buy-in and say, hey, it's a small amount of money, you're investing X, and we can do Y, which is 15 second improvement on six minutes. Um, and that will be our first project. And when we succeed with this, then we'll build on it and do something else. And you have that brainstorm list. But but yeah, those are those, that, that's kind of the summary of my advice is start yeah. with somewhere we already are measuring and then have small and a small incremental improvement to that, not some... <laughs> that's where they make yeah, mistakes yeah. i'm gonna imply, i'm gonna implement this technology and do this and do this do all these things i've never done before i'm gonna hire some in some data scientists i'm gonna use a consulting firm and then we're gonna try to change our average handle time by two minutes in yeah. six months and it's like no wonder why you're failing it's too much complexity in this project and you don't have a capacity and internal capability to execute on it so of course you're gonna fail 
and that's where I've seen things. Yeah, you decide. you have both. Yeah, no, thank you. I th I think it's very very useful. I hope uh, you know many people will listen to this, and it, I think it will really help uh, to implement AI projects uh, more successfully. Now, you both have uh, wide experience, also working with companies, organizations. Um, with mentioning or not mentioning the names, what is your, what is one of the use cases where you get excited uh, about where you say, well, here is is if if I had a, if I had to write a textbook, this would be the one that um, yeah that I would uh, put forward. Uh, Seth, starting with you. The use cases that that we our, our organization has is on the the metric that I was just sharing, uh, which is the average handle time. And we've been able to, to drop it by 25 percent. So that isn't that isn't like that. That is something that took time to get to. So we, we have. So how much time did it take? Uh, six months, we, it, but not in the beginning. In the beginning, it's like a year. Like we, you, you work with different customers mm -hmm. and you you tweak things and you evolve and you develop. And like I said, we, we brought this into our product. Our product originally was knowledge management. And we brought the original project I was telling you about that was 10 years ago was a, an AI knowledge management product that failed. Um, so there was that, that muscle memory there of trying to start smaller. And yeah, we, I think we first got, you know, you know, 10% and that was a big win and then 15 and then 20 and, and then, and then you get, you, you get to a point where the, impact is so noticeable the impact is so easy to perceive for the customer or for you as an organization again if your services because it, it's the same that um it's undeniable that what you're doing has an impact and then you you've got that organizational muscle and people like you've just empowered your sales force and you've empowered yeah. your customer your own customer success and you've you've empowered your organization around mm -hmm. success versus like the hype and the hot air yeah, thank you, Seth. Rob, uh, your use case uh, for the textbook, uh, which one would it be? Yeah, so the one we've been spending huge amounts of time on is all around financial crime. Um, and the reason why is because today the financial institutions around the world catch about 1% of all the criminal activity uh, that flows through the financial system. So 99% of all the illicit money is uh, unidentified. Mm. So, you know, from a societal perspective, um, you know, I, I, I'd love to make a difference to that. I, I'd love to be able to identify, you know, when there's human trafficking happening, for example, and there's a pattern that we can identify that clearly shows this is, you know, human trafficking that's, that's happening. Um, and, you know, I won't say it's, it's easy, but I actually think, if you could get organizations to collaborate and agree to put their data together in, you know, in smart ways, it would be a whole lot easier than it is today. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we've been involved in one project. Um, it, it took about eight weeks to do the technical part. It took 18 months to get the lawyers to agree how they were going to allow the technical part to happen. You know, so for CEOs in an organization um, where there's sensitivity to the data to really understand uh, again, that this isn't, this isn't only about technology. This is about bringing all facets of, of, of your business together that it, that would be legal compliance um, privacy, you know, from a, from a GDPR perspective, all of these yeah. things ultimately touch the outcome. Uh, so I, think that's sure a, that, really I think that's a great uh, summary <laughs> because we, uh, we um, this is our last minute of fame. So um, I think the fact that you say, you know, this brings really business uh, um, integrated in the whole business and it's a full circle rather than uh, a um, uh, something that is um, um, that is um, that is a one time off. Uh, we close this session because um, we are we are at the end of the time. I I, uh, I see that we had a message that we basically um, are um, we can stay as long as we want, but uh, this is the end of the session. We have Thomas who joined us and is now gone. 
So I would like to thank you, both of you. Um, and um, yeah, I, you know, for me, if anything else, uh, it was great meeting you. That was in it for me because I really enjoyed uh, our uh, preparation talks. And uh, I, I, I hope to be able to meet uh, with you. Um, uh, if you are sometime in the Netherlands, I would love to have you um, over and uh, and also perhaps uh, do a guest lecture. <laughs> uh, but it was really uh, very insightful. And I so recognize also working with companies here. I so recognize um, your, um, yeah, your, your assessment of what can be done and what uh, perhaps should be done. Uh, but uh, yeah, very interesting. So thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, also, uh, good luck uh, yeah that's not even the word i want to use i don't know what i want to use but a lot of uh, support and strength for the people that you work with that are in this situation as i said it's it's uh, i have a heavy heart uh, and uh, i thank you for taking time in this uh, you know because i know you've both uh, a zillion other things to do so thank you so much for this and for the nice cooperation i really enjoyed it Great working with both of you. Really, really appreciated it. Uh, really a fun session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.